In today's episode, I speak to Tina Berger about being still long enough to listen. This conversation follows Tina's views on inspiration, creativity and curiosity and how the scientific method isn't everything. Brainstorming becomes a competitive sport if we're not careful. How can groups work better together and what role has deep listening have when individuals work together? What conditions are needed to inspire inspiration? And what steps are needed to be able to inspire others? Listen up to the rest of the conversation. Before we begin our conversation, here is a quick shout out to the Pathologically Curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke Maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a Maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today, our guest is Tina Berger. Hi, Tina. Hi there. How's life with you? It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. That's cool. Before we get into the conversation, tell us about you. Well, um, there's that's a big question. That's a very open-ended question. Um, the things about me that might be useful for folks who don't know anything about me um, are that I live in Houston, Texas. I am a person who has traveled um, my whole life. So I grew up traveling as a as the daughter of a military um, uh, man and so and, and family. And, uh, and so we traveled around and I got exposed to a lot of different kinds of people in different countries. My mother's an, an immigrant to the United States. So I grew up feeling kind of like a global citizen in a way. Um, big reader, uh, interested in all kinds of things, um, got interested in business young and also uh, financial um, literacy and things like that. And so it was quite difficult for me to hone in on what I was going to do in my um, in, in university and in um, and in my life with my work. I ended up getting an undergraduate degree in English literature and then went straight into business and started writing um, technical documentation, um, work processes. And uh, this was, you know, just to kind of give you a sense of my age, uh, back in the early 90s. So I was inside of large corporations, uh, think large, big multinational energy corporations, because I, I uh, graduated from the University of Houston with uh, with my degree and, uh, and went into... Uh, uh, into work immediately doing this kind of work where I was looking at how people were were working and being fascinated really by that. And it was right at the time where um, a lot of processes were becoming more integrated. A lot of computing systems were beginning to be connected up with each other. Uh, and uh, And some things were going from being on paper to being uh, in a computer. So this changed people's work lives and their work processes a lot. And it was quite threatening to many people. And that got me very interested in uh, the, the combination of technology and, and people and how they see their work and, and change, like major change being kind of thrust upon people uh, in, in the way they saw it. And then how do you engage people? How do we reduce the level of fear? And uh, and how do we help people uh, adopt new ways of working? And that's really what my career has been. I eventually did my um, my my MBA at uh, University of Houston as well with a with an emphasis in uh, in energy. Um, and I have a, a kind of a a, a sidebar interest in just personal development, my own, becoming a better person, a, a, a more aware, a more conscious, a more compassionate person myself. So I have my own 
uh, journey that I've been on there, my practices. And, um, and so I've written a book uh, recently. I released a, a book called um, Coming Around. Uh, and that book is my story about how I realized that in order to be successful in the structures and systems that we have in the West, there was a part of me that I really had to ignore or turn off or learn to um, minimize, which was, uh, which was the receptive aspect of myself, which was the, the emotional aspect of myself, which was the, the, the parts of myself that uh, that 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 knows it's connected with everything else. This, so there's the, there's a way that our systems focus on and emphasize individual achievement and individual work, and um, and also logic and rationality over emotion. And also, so there's a minimizing of really half of who we are as humans, you know. And so I have a lot of practices that I have. Um, engaged with and experiments that I've run on myself to create more flexibility in how I uh, show up. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so there's two pieces. There's the work piece, and then there's the personal development piece, and then there's uh, all the ways that those things intertwine in how I show up. Um, it's a fun, <laughs> it's a fun existence. It's a fun life that I live. Cool. Thank you for sharing that, Tina. I think it's interesting that you say that you did experiments on yourself. Um, tell me about that. What kind of things did you do? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly doing them. So I can, uh, I started out just by surprising myself, um, deciding to sign up for, you know, I, I think my first yoga class I, I signed up for, actually a friend signed me up for it. Uh, and I just started going, um, must have been about 28, 29 years ago. Uh, and that was, that made me realize, that was one of the things that made me realize how much there was that I wasn't um, engaged with or attending to because there were changes in my, uh, in my, what I should say is I was doing therapy. I was doing like um, uh, traditional talk therapy to work through some really old wounds and issues that kept getting in my way. And really I didn't, I, they weren't like major things. They were just kind of like your traditional everyday. <laughs> I need to express more clearly what it is I need and not have people guess. I need not, I need to be um, uh, more forthright and more aware of my own feelings when I make decisions, things like that. And what I realized when I took the yoga was that the yoga was making my therapy go faster, was making it easier for me to interrupt old patterns and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. What else could I do with my physical body? What else could I do with my breath? What else could I do? What other things are out there? So I signed up for, I, so I, I took, uh, I, I did a whole series of things which I've kind of documented um, and some of them are quite humorous um, in my book. But one, uh, one was, for example, I did an, an ecstatic dance. Uh, I signed up for an ecstatic dance class, which was way out of character, you know, because at the same time, I have this very kind of straight ahead work career as a consultant. Um, I've also done a wilderness rites of passage uh, experience where I went out into uh, with a with a group in in uh, California called the, the School of Lost Borders, and they take people out and they mark changes, major changes in their life. So things that you're trying to release, you you go out and you you say, these are the things that I'm trying to release. These are the things that I would like to take on. And these are gifts that I'm trying to step into. Um, you And you have a little bit of instruction for how you're going to stay safe um, alone on the land for four days. Uh, and so you take your tarp and very minimal uh, equipment and you uh, and you fast from food and you you take water, you take plenty of water. It's not actually physically dangerous, dangerous. Uh, and you fast alone for four days um, on the land and and you take everything that occurs out there as a symbol uh, messages to you and come back after four days in community again and tell this story. So these are some of the, these are a couple of, of examples. Right now I'm experimenting with Wim Hof's method, which is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a, uh, they call him the Iceman. He's a, a guy who, um, uh, who does a lot of powerful breath work and also uh, um, 
sits in ice. That's part of, uh, sits in ice water. <clears throat> and by doing, and he's been studied by a lot of people. So I'm, I'm experimenting with those kinds of things, cold plunges and, uh, and, and uh, breath work. Thank you. I think it's interesting that you use the word experiment because that's because a lot of mavericks do see things like that as experiments. Whereas I know that other people would have said um, to try something new or whatever. But to say like experiment shows that you have a hypothesis that you are testing. Yeah. And then you'll be reviewing. So it's not accidental. It's like, I wonder if X would happen if I did Y or what would happen. Let's set this up as an experiment and we'll review it at the end. So it's kind of purposeful. A little bit. Um, sometimes it's just intuitive. So there's, there's, I think that's actually a really interesting point, Judith, is that sometimes um, I am experimenting in a way that I know what I think the answer is going to be, or I have an idea that, of, that it might help me in this way. In other cases, I'm sort of following a gut feeling like I was, I've done a daily morning practice for many years now, and normally it's a seated practice. And about three months ago, um, I started having this feeling while I was doing this practice, which was, you know, a meditative practice. Hey, you need to stand up. It was like an instinct. It was like a little voice. And I, uh, and my, my reaction was, oh, I thought, well, this is just, uh, you know, this is just a, a mental um, distraction. And so I need to kind of hold the course and, and it was, and, and, but the flavor of it was very different than other, than other distractions. It didn't feel like that. It just felt like a very gentle tap on the shoulder. It's time for you to stand up. And I thought, what does that mean? Metaphorically, it's time for me to stand up. And also I don't have a standing meditation. I don't know what that is, you know? So it it sort of pushed me to be open to, well, what other options are there for a standing meditation? And about a week later, one of my friends said, hey, I'm I'm taking a Tai Chi class. Would you would you like to to be a part of that and join me? And I thought that's a standing, like that's a moving standing meditation. And yes, I do. So there are both things happening there. One is, yes, I'm following those things. And yes, I have an idea that I can understand a relatedness um, and I could have a, a hypothesis, but I'm also very much tuned into my intuition now, in a way that um, wouldn't have been character uh, wouldn't have characterized me maybe 15 years ago. Thank you. If you are looking for a standing meditation, then Qigong has some standing meditation, some standing forms. Yes, so you might want to check that out. I think from what you were saying. Um, I'm wondering, is that how you get to the, the three line tags that you have in terms of inspiration, creativity, and curiosity? Can you tell me about that? So um, inspiration is, uh, is, is very interesting. And, and I, so we're, if I, if I kind of, kind of character over characterize the, the West and I, I say, we're off, we're not very good breathers. We're, uh, we spend a lot of, our, a lot of our breath stays in, we're very, we're very active, we're very action oriented, we're very, we, we assess our, um, our successes of our, or we, uh, we, we look at our days and we say, how much did I get done? Um, and so there's a very much a, a focus on do and not a focus on, on being. So there's, there's an out of balanceness there. And in the breath, that means we, we keep our breath in the very top of our chest. We're not really good deep breathers. And in order to be inspired, so actually the inspiration breath is the, is the, is the inhale. And so the, there's an actual correlation between inhaling and inspiration. So um, what, where I'm going with this is a lot of the practices that you will find out there that are meditative practices um, encourage us or incorporate these um, some sort of receptive breathing, some deeper breathing. Um, so how are we taking in all of the things that might have some information that we could process that would give us insights? Um, as far as kind of innovation and creativity, um, we're not really 
gifted at, we don't, we know how to do uh, the scientific method to your point earlier. We know how to do that. And we're very good at that. And that is a very valuable um, approach to uh, making our lives predictable and understanding how things and materials, uh, you know, and energies interact. But there's this whole almost, um, there's a whole set of things that we don't really understand exactly how they work. And they feel a little bit mysterious, like insight. Like what is it that causes a spark of insight? What is it that happens when, what's happening? What are the conditions that, that make it more likely that we're gonna be inspired? Well, one is breathing more deeply. One is sitting more still. I think it was Thomas Edison who uh, used to fall asleep on his front porch. This is the, this is the the lure anyway, with a, a ball bearing or something heavy in his hand, and uh, and the minute that it when it dropped and it it would wake him up and he would have maybe an insight at that moment. So um, we do in corporate America anyway. I'm very familiar with this setting. What we, when we're trying to come up with ideas and generate, um, and you know, innovations and and create new things, we have we do brainstorming, which is really a a competitive process, uh, mm. which is really like maybe seven or eight people sitting around a table with that brought their idea for what they think the right solution is to this problem, and we need to solve this problem fast. Um, and so we're going to give 10 minutes to brainstorming. Then you're going to say why you think your idea is good. And whoever wins at <laughs> whoever wins at collaboration and brainstorming, that's whose idea we pick. It's very seldom that you see a really integrated um, idea form. Mostly it's one of the ideas that came almost fully intact. And so when I'm looking at the, the inspiration, I'm looking at how do we do inspiration as individuals? How do we open ourselves to more possibilities and hold them and listen to, um, listen and hold them well enough so that they, they can integrate, that they can inspire, that they can become uh, more fully formed before we action them. And in teams and groups, how can we listen to each other very, very deeply? Because that's another thing that I have, in my own experience, discovered there's a magic to, you know, which is really taking in the full person. And there are some practices. So I've been talking about individual practices. There are some community and group practices, many of which are very old, much more old than our culture of how you listen deeply to someone else, how you listen deeply in a circle of people so that you're not just taking in their words and parsing them and trying to uh, make sense of them, but you're also taking in the person and the person's intention and the person's feeling and the significance of what the person is saying. And so that's a much more material than what we're used to taking in from a person in a group. And so when you teach a whole group to do that, um, magic happens. <clears throat> and you end up with almost in a, uh, a fluidity, a flow that creates conditions under which really different ideas and possibilities might emerge, which for me, is why I keep doing this work is because I know there are solutions to some of these big, big problems that we're encountering as humans on this planet together that we could solve if we could learn how to listen better, not just to our own intuition, yes, to other people, but also to what our surroundings and this planet and the other beings on it are telling us. Okay, thank you for that. So. If someone's listening right now and they've got a pen and a pe piece of paper and they would like to be better at inspiring others and being more creative, what steps do they need to take to make it happen? So, uh, you know, first of all, I would say um, it's important to 
find things that inspire you. Uh, and, and so there's a small voice inside of yourself that knows what those things are, you know, so I could give you some things to start with and you could go uh, like, and, and so if, so th this is what I would say is if, if I would listen to your gut, there are lots of things out there for how to build your own awareness, um, meditation practice, uh, dance, nature walks, uh, um, you know, doing art, but not art with necessarily art with the, an objective uh, necessarily, but like free art, free form art and in, look for, but the, 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 the reason why I'm struggling to answer this question a little bit, Judith, is, is that part of what um, I feel like is really important is to be still long enough to, to take the time for yourself to create a space where you're listening for what would inspire you. We, we have a lot of voices in our heads and a lot of voices outside of us that tell us what we should be doing all day. Um, and none of those voices say sit quietly and be inspired. Uh, and so if I were gonna start with one thing, I would say create some space that is sacred receptive space for yourself. Even if it's 10 minutes a day where you create a little area in your house uh, in a corner where or in a, or in or at a place that has a view of of your garden or maybe even outside where you take your 10 minutes and and all you do there is 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 hold the intention of being receptive to inspiration and what may come to you are the answers to what else you might do that would grow that capacity in you that would feed that human need to uh to uh, apprehend and know beauty uh, and connection and uh, inspiration and creativity. So even if you just sit there for 10 minutes and breathe and take in the beauty that's around you, light candles, whatever it is that feels intuitively to you, like it creates a sacred receptive space, that would be a good place to start. Yeah, I must say, when I... When I have to speak creatively, uh, if I work something out, I do tend to spend some time getting knowledge, getting data, so and, and like think of all the different things that could be cross-related and da, da da And then I go away and spend, you know, let my subconscious deal with, with the data, spend some time away. And then when I want to normally overnight, at least at, at some significant time between all that data gathering and then I let it emerge and I sit there going right and then it just I you know I'm quite what's the autological thinker I'm also very much an emergent thinker so mm -hmm. I can see I can see why and how that would work so you said there was a few things about that so so I understand what you're saying you're saying if you want to have is be inspirational creative and have curiosity is one is to be still be quiet find somewhere that you can let ideas and things bubble over what else can be done I mean what about mm -hmm. I can't say that's good for creativity what about curiosity what are the sort of things you should be doing for that yeah um that's uh also a beautiful question thank you you know I I think that when we the way that we live um and and is that we have very specific actions and to-do lists that we go through our day with and we look back on the day and go, how much did we get done of that was what was already on our list? And, you know, and then we kind of say, well, was it a successful day? Was it not? Was it a successful year? Was it not? Without space for following uh, fascination, following interest, following flashes of uh, what feels like it's correct. We end up overriding what the body knows it needs, what the spirit knows it needs uh, for what's next, because we have logically already planned out our day. And again, structure is good. Structure creates, uh, uh, creates a predictability. Um, we do that for a lot of good reasons. And uh, now we've kind of overdone that to the point where we don't really have a lot of additional space to follow our curiosity. So even if I just take the example of a walk, many people walk every day for exercise. Many people, um, uh, it's possible to walk for exercise and it's also possible to walk just for inspiration where you're really paying attention to what, 
what you're noticing in your in your surroundings. But possibly there's a you 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 find yourself noticing a lot of yellow flowers, and that's a message to you about you could I mean, what I'm saying is that you could take this as a message and you could be inquisitive about why do I notice yellow flowers? What is the symbolism of yellow? What could yellow be telling me um, if I followed it? And without taking it completely seriously as a research project, right? But to go wow. Follow, I could come back and I could look up the meaning of yellow, but also just notice things that are happening in the world that you particularly have curiosity about, whether it's a, a, a sort of an animal, whether it's an activist, um, uh, um, you know, a particular um, activist movement that, you, that you're fascinated by, whether it's, um, you know, cryptocurrencies or any number of things and, and create space for yourself to follow that and see where it takes you. Those things are, those kinds of curiosity I see as a path to inspiration, as a path to richness and, uh, and knowing beauty and knowing surprise. When you plan everything out, there isn't space for surprise. And surprise is where like so much magic happens and so much beauty happens in that. That's where laughter happens. That's where joy happens. When something happens in your life that you didn't expect because you followed something that you normally wouldn't have done or followed, or you've put yourself in a position where uh, something would could happen that you didn't plan for. Uh, so you know, I, I think following uh, following threads that of sparks of 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 interest, we can get out of the habit of because we mute those things because no, I can't do that. I have to make this and do that, and I have to get this email out, and I'll do it later. And you never get around to doing it later. And our our lives go gray that way. Mm. I can I can get behind that because a lot of uh, maverick leaders when they're doing strategy, they're more concerned about strategic direction. Mm -hmm, that's right. They build in uh, wiggle room because, it, you know, it's it's a nonsense to believe that, you know, people tend to have really long uh, strategic timelines and that's with, with very detailed points all the way through it. And it's like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> because yeah. you know it's going to be different. So whereas if you say... This is where we're going, and at this point, this point, and this point, we need to have been here, there, and everywhere. Then the, the gaps between allows things to happen. True, uh, you know, for my own my own um, process. Uh, also, there are things now that our challenges are very complex, and the information that's coming into us as leaders is is coming from is so there's so much of it. Mm -hmm. There are things and perspectives that we have because of our own um, our own patterning that we see. And there are things that other people see and know because of their own gifts and patterning uh, and their own difference in perception that we need. And if if so, we have to build that flexibility in. we can hold a vision without being anchored to a particular plan. And we can. We can continue to check in. So the way this process could could work, which is a little bit different than what we've done in the past, because you know all of the futurists will tell us, "Hey, things are way more, way less predictable now than they ever have been. We know less about what's going to be happening in five years now than we ever have." You know, just because of so many, so many variables in play right now that we're aware of. So this idea of like, what is it that we're trying to be in service to? And that's the vision. And then we, we create, let's just say a year plan and we begin to move in that direction. And then we continue to come back to this vision and ask the question, is this still serving that? Is what we're doing still serving that? Because if it's not, then maybe we need to change the plan because the vision is what we're up to. We're not up to the plan. You know, we're, if the vision is that we are um, trying to make, uh, you know, so if I say my, my own personal vision is that I want to be a part of creating new systems and, uh, and new ways of working that serve future generations. 
uh, that serve a, a more sustainable planet, um, then I look at my work every day and I say, is what I'm doing in service to that? St still in service to that? If it's not in service to that, how do I need to adjust? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's cool. That's a great place to end, I think, in terms of um, a good reflection. But before we do that, just to, can you share a tip for inspiration? So if you want to inspire others, what one tip would you give someone? Um, so if, if you want to inspire others, um, then live an inspired life, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so demonstrate what that what that looks and feels like and how you live. And there are some keys to that. One is curiosity. So we've talked about curiosity and deep listening. Those things are very inspiring because partially because they're so rare for someone to really sit down and take the time to fully listen and hear someone is a very powerful thing. To ask somebody their story and to fully take in their story, that happens very seldom. So that's mm -hmm. a powerful piece of, that's one little powerful thing you can do, but also just sharing your own stories of inspiration, creativity, surprise. People become, they feel that longing in themselves because we have muted ourselves so much to be more productive. Uh, and there's, again, I'm not being dismissive of productivity where there's a lot of goodness about that. And we also need, we also need stillness and connection and commune, communion with each other. Uh, and so deep listening provides that and storytelling and sharing experiences that are um, very different from let's go through our same work process again in the same way we've done it. So introducing new things into the work setting, um, sending people off into an inspiration walk for five minutes uh, outside prior to having a meeting. I mean, little things like that can go a long way to re-engaging, reigniting creativity with within groups and and uh, and families and people. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, Tina, would you come back again? Oh, I'd love to. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Tina as much as I enjoyed having it. At the Maverick Paradox, we improve your impact and influence by enabling you to effectively strategize, innovate, and execute. To find out more, contact us at judith at maverickparadox.com. Thank you. Are you interested in Maverick leadership but unsure how to apply it? We can help. Judith Germain has collaborated with David Chislett to produce a 12-part video series on Maverick leadership and how to apply it to your creative thinking skills. This will truly get you thinking and putting into action your ability to innovate and execute, truly changing your outcomes. Check out the show notes for the link or contact us on judith at maverickparadox.com for more information. If you are pathologically curious and would love to find out more about the Maverick Paradox, then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick paradox the secret power behind successful leaders for those that love a good discussion you could apply to join our exclusive facebook group finally if you would like to work with us or are interested in the maverick at work check out maverickparadox.co.uk